if you go to our website, focusonthekingdom.org, you'll see that one of our beliefs is that Christians should never take up arms and kill their enemies and fellow believers in other nations. And you'll find a series of scriptures there from Matthew 26, 52, which we will read at 1 Peter 2. I'd like to remind us of this very important part of our so-called Christian living. So yes, we are kingdom citizens. We're supposed to behave in a different way with a different mindset as we transverse trials and tribulations of this present evil age. I've always said that when it comes to this topic, I came to Christianity when I was 32, 33 years of age, relatively old. <laughs> and um, I did not grow up in church. So when I became a Christian, I converted to Christianity. When it comes to this topic, I describe it as a switch in my head. It, it was on a default setting and it was the violence switch. There's a, what I would call a default setting for all of humanity when it comes to this topic. An example, a practical example is if you're walking down the street and someone does something to you, either as a physical thing, as a physical harm, or some of us who are thin skinned, as they say, than others, if someone looks at you the wrong way, right? Your, your hair sticks up, your, especially for men, right? You, you go, Hey, what are you looking at? So there's this default setting in all of us. When I became a Christian and started reading the Bible for the first time, especially obviously the New Testament, which talks about this topic in length, I called it a default setting switch. I had to change. Uh, and that went along with other things in my life, a whole different type of worldview and understanding of sin. You know, Jesus famously said, I think in John, the Gospel of John, that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of, of sin. That, that's the only way we can understand what's happening in the world. And that was as a, someone who did not have a religious beliefs, that was another thing I had to change uh, in my thinking. And the Bible calls that uh, repenting, uh, which is basically just changing the way you think, the way you act, and even the way you look. In, on the screen there for our audience online, I have a, a title for this lesson, uh, A Time to Kill. This uh, goes back to the text in Ecclesiastes about there's a time to mourn, a time to laugh, a time to build up, a time to tear down. So there will be a time to kill for Christians, but the point is that not yet. Uh, in distinction to, I'll take an example that's very relevant or has been for millennia now, the faith of Islam. So Islam has a very violent strain within it, where a lot of its adherents, a lot of the Islamic followers interpret their text called the Quran in a certain way that makes them militant, very much involved in the violence of today. Mm -hmm. And they see that as something that Allah, the name for their God, uh, commands them. Some refer to it as jihad, You've probably heard that word. Other Islamic people say, well, you know, they take that too literal or something, but the teaching is there of violence. But in the New Testament, as we will see, there are scriptures in the New Testament that rebuke violence for followers of the Messiah, Jesus. So we'll start with Luke 9. The apostles of Jesus are asking an actually very Bible based question because their understanding is that God will intervene at this time, sometimes does intervene rather violently. In the Old Testament, we see how Old, uh, Old Testament prophets, the story of, was it Elijah who was bullied, called a baldy? And remember, there's a the, the very horror, horror story of, a, was it a bear, mauled or killed the, his enemies? So children were mocking uh, the prophet Elijah and a bear came and ate the children, probably ate them. So there are very much a lot of examples like that you will find in the Hebrew Bible or what we call the Old Testament. So when the apostles asked Jesus to bring the uh, fire down from heaven, they're working within that framework of their religious understanding and convictions. But the coming of Jesus was a very radical change for Judaism. Jesus did, did not 
come simply to repeat Moses. So in Matthew 5, Jesus famously cites some of the written law known as the Torah. And Jesus says things, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I say. So Jesus is bringing about what we come to know as a new covenant system. And Jesus, I believe, practiced that and preached that, obviously, because you have to practice what you preach, lest you become a hypocrite like the Pharisees. So I think Jesus does that. So the apostles here in Luke 9 are very much being rebuked. They're very much being told, listen, there's a different way to do this now by the Spirit. Now, some translations or some of your Bible versions will add there, uh, as I have on the screen, what's it? that's verse 55. Right, so some manuscripts vary on Luke 9, verse 55 regarding that saying, but I'll take that as, it sounds like Jesus, something Jesus would have said to me. I have a quote there from uh, Hayes, uh, a book called The Moral Vision of the New Testament. So that's a quote regarding the famous Matthew 26 episode. If you remember, Jesus is about to be arrested. The betrayal, it says an arrest in my New English translation. And then Peter picks up the sword and tries to defend not only his friend, but his Rabboni, his teacher, the person he loves. Now, what's interesting here, if you look at the history of these sayings or these uh, stories of Jesus, the early church for the most part understood these type of sayings or teachings or commands by Jesus at their word. So you'll find that a lot of the so-called church fathers like Irenaeus, Tertullian, they apply that to themselves and a lot of christians in in the early time of the christian movement died as uh, let's say unarmed so they chose to go to for example the Colosseums of the romans and just be thrown to the animals and and killed alive eaten alive because their understanding, this new covenant system that Jesus brought in, and they they're taking him and, and what the apostles later say at their word, as in do not repay evil for evil. You know, uh, in Romans 12, Paul talks about how the Christian behavior should be very much different from the government behavior or the government institution in Romans chapter 13. So you'll find that these verses, like Matthew 26, 52, were applied very much in the practice and living of those early Christians. You know, I, I would ask you to read the history and, and see the horrors of the martyrdom age, as it's called, of the church, where you had uncles and grandfathers and mothers and fathers and children not picking up swords, instead finding pride in being slaughtered and dying as their Lord Jesus did without uh, hurting their enemies, in this case, the government and the Roman Empire, obviously persecuting them. What we'll do is we'll go through uh, some of Jesus' sayings about this issue, and they're mostly found in what's known as parables. And you will see that the Christian attitude, mindset for today, for right now, and un until the, the kingdom comes, is that, is that we have to sometimes suffer violence done to ourselves, our family, our friends, but in expectation of the kingdom. We often pray, you know, may your kingdom come. But in that prayer, you must understand that it will be a time to kill. It will be the judgment of God. Now, most of these parables we're going to read up here in Matthew, and you'll see there that the context in Matthew 7, again, I'm looking at my new English translation, it has do not judge, and then it has ask, seek, and knock, and then Jesus will talk about the narrow gate, and now we'll start reading what the NET calls a tree and its fruit. So what will happen to false prophets? So that verse... Uh, they will be burnt up, verse 19. So Jesus is making an agricultural example here, as he always does. He describes people as trees. 
and he describes the judgment, which is in the future, as fire. Jesus is speaking here as an Old Testament prophet. And by that, I mean that he uses language and imagery of people like King David, who was a prophet, by the way. We forget King David was a prophet. In Psalm 21, uh, David says in verse 8, you prevail over all your enemies. Your power is too great for those who hate you. Verse 9, you burn them up like a fiery furnace when you appear. The Lord angrily devours them, the enemies. The fire consumes them. So Jesus is using this very well-known Old Testament prophetic way of describing what will happen to people like false prophets. It would be interesting for you to note as a statistical matter, verse 9, that language of thrown in furnace, burned in fire, is one of the most used in the New Testament. I think in my stat sheet, you have Daniel 7.13, the most alluded to or cited verse by the New Testament writers. And then I believe came Psalm 21, <laughs> verse 9. So this is very important for Jesus' teaching. The enemies, the false prophets in this case of Matthew 7, will be thrown in a furnace like trees and burned up. It's very important to understand that the wicked will be burned up, consumed. You have minor prophets like Amos. They use similar language. Uh, they talk about the wicked, the enemies of God, like hay, like grass, dried up grass, hay, and they... They're like the shaft that burns. So nothing will be left of these people. So that obviously contradicts what the Catholic belief, Protestant belief of this eternal torment in some hell. So in Matthew 21, as, as a context, you have, again, I'm reading from my new English translation. I have the subtitle here, the triumphal entry. He, you have the cleansing of the temple. You have the story of the withered victory and then according to the net you have the authority of jesus and then the parable of the two sons and then the chapter ends with what the net calls the parable of the tenants so that's the key there that last verse my net has utterly destroyed so again this goes along with psalm 21 9 where the wicked will be utterly forever like shaft burning uh, destroyed. And then note there the, la the last phrase, at the harvest. He'll then talk about how before the coming, the parousia of Christ, and he will gather the elect Christians, believers, like uh, gather wheat, right? Like a harvest. So that's the harvest. At the harvest, in other words, is another way of speaking about the parousia, the second coming. If you look at the parallel account of this story in uh, Luke 20, starting at verse 9, you'll see again, 9.15, they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So what will the owner of the vineyard do to them, the wicked servants? Luke 9.16, he will come and destroy those farmers, give the vineyard to others. So it's pretty much the, the same story. So that's in Luke 20, if you, if you want to see the parallel. Again, the point here is that these are what what's known as end days or last days or the future, to use the big word, eschatological, apocalyptic sayings of Jesus. This is not for right now what happens when he comes. Let's go now to the next chapter in 22. So he continues this from chapter 21 with another parable, Jesus. So at the end of, just to go back a little bit, at the end of 21, he gives a warning to his fellow Jews, right? He says, for this reason, in Matthew 21, 43, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you, you Jews, you Israelites, to whom belong the promises. But because they keep rejecting God's anointed one, the Messiah, the kingdom, in a sense, will be taken away from them, or most of them. We know there's a remnant and given to another people. So that's Matthew 21, 43. And then he'll continue these apocalyptic stories with what the NET calls here on, in my translation, 
the parable of the wedding banquet. The point here is the threat of violence and the ultimate execution. Now, the wedding banquet, uh, if you look at the, again, the Old Testament, Jesus, once again, although he's the new covenant messenger, Jesus, once again, though, is very much steeped in Old Testament prophetic ways of speaking, are talking about the state of the world, the present evil age. They talk about Israel, how unfaithful you are. You're a prostitute, selling out your goods. So for the most part, that is a very downbeat prophetic word. And again, the point here of the wedding banquet, a well-known Jewish description, I guess, of the kingdom. Now, whether is it a literal banquet, are we going to have a literal massive <laughs> seed and all this? Well, we'll, we'll find out. But the point is, although it's a time of festivity, eating and fellowship, that has a price. Again, my point today is to appeal to fellow Christians who see differently than us regarding violence, Christian uh, interaction with politics and the military and so forth and so on, but also understand our trials and tribulations that we must go through now at many times when we must stay silent and sometimes suffer violence, but it does lead to wedding banquet. To, now let's go a couple of chapters in Matthew 24, Olivet prophecy or the prophecy of the end times or the last days. So one of the most uh, famous, I think, perhaps, uh, maybe if you, Sermon on the Mount, certainly, but then Matthew 24 certainly is up there. And the context here is Jesus, the prophet. Again, he's a very much Old Testament prophet. So he's prophesying here about the events that need to take place before he comes back. He talks about the destruction of the temple, and then he talks about persecution of disciples. He'll talk about a thing called the abomination of desolation, which goes back to the other prophet, Daniel. And then he moves into the parousia, the coming or the arrival of the Son of Man. And then he gives you a parable of a fig tree starting in verse 32 and then we'll pick it up in verse 36 and read at the end of the chapter there the parallel saying of, of this story of this prophecy i should say luke 12 46 uh that servant's master will return unexpectedly one day and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers very much total violent and again no eternal punishment burning in some hell fire like catholics and many protestants believe you'll note here um the days of noah i don't think as bad as it is now you know the the world the situation present evil age i think the days of noah were worse i think they were i mean you had the giants you had these things you know causing havoc chaos but it was a situation where Genesis 6, I'm thinking of, the scripture says that people thought evil all the time, 24-7. You know, I'd like to think that we're not there yet. The point here is that the world will go back to that just evil, de demonized, totally depraved situation before the, the parousia. It will be the same so when the Son of Man comes. Uh, therefore, be alert. So it's the threat of violence. It's the threat of total destruction, annihilation at the second coming, at the parousia. It's an uh, alert also to be ready, right? Uh, 2444, therefore, you also must be ready. The Son of Man will come unexpectedly. Now, let's go to the next chapter. Let's go back to Gospel of Matthew 24. Like I said, most of these parable sayings appear in the Gospel of Matthew rather interestingly. So there you have another parable called by some the parable of the ten virgins. Again, it's about be ready, keep your light on. And then there's a parable known as the parable of the talents. And then we'll read from verse 31, and the NET here has the judgment. The point here, once again, is you notice the setting, the second coming, verse 30, 31. Very clear. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels with him, then he will sit in heaven. No, <laughs> on his throne. Where's his throne? In a place called Jerusalem. All the nations will be assembled. So 
definitely very clearly that to, at least we can i think all agree that that is second coming language judgment language and then uh, we can talk about the identity of the sheep and the goats and obviously the clear thing here too is about the destiny of the goats now the language of sheep and goats is taken as you probably know from another prophet remember jesus although he's a new covenant messenger he's very much an old testament prophetic messenger too so he sort of straddles if i can say both fences the sheep and the goats uh, comes from ezekiel chapter 34 most probably it's an illusion definitely and you have there an image of shepherds the evil shepherds the evil leaders of the sheep right and how god yahweh in ezekiel 34 will judge them accordingly and how again looking to the future what we call as christians the second coming the old testament prophets call it the day of the lord but in ezekiel 34 just for your notes 34 23 the point is that god says i will set one shepherd over them so he'll replace all these wicked shepherds all these bad leaders with the one typically the old testament uh, called that that one shepherd david which is another name really for the messiah for his son and these uh, goats will have the same ending the same ending total destruction total death annihilation eventually anyway there will be punishment they'll depart into eternal punishment now be careful here your translations oftentimes do not help the punishment is eternal in the sense of an annihilation right you cannot have the bible talk about life as a gift from god that you will have for e eternity as we understand is eternity immortality so you cannot have that as a gift from god but at the same time the wicked will still be living somehow so both groups have life will, will have the life no the one group has to have no life which is not the gift it'll sort of contradict the actual gift of immortality or, or what your translation calls eternal life if the other group also has in some mm -hmm. in some sense continued life i'll be in a awful state of punishment if you have anthony's translation if you're looking at online by the way one god translation.com you'll notice anthony's uh paraphrase of jude 7 just to give an example they're an example in suffering the punishment of the fire of the age to come so again it's a bit uh, difficult perhaps because your translation you're probably used to eternal the word eternal right in there but anthony's point is that the greek aeonios is of the age to the age something like that or at that time at that age you'll see also anthony's translation and commentary about jude 7 and i'll just read it here this is a highly instructive verse in regard to the nature of future punishment which is not unending torture as taught by some systems i would say the whole system <laughs> The fire which destroys Sodom and Gomorrah is not still burning. Nevertheless, it's called eternal fire. The other interesting thing you'll notice about the biblical writings is that the word eternal is applied to the fire or the smoke. Um, there's a saying, if someone can remind me about the worm that never dies, the worm that never dies. So the eternality, if you will, the H to the H are things like fire and the smoke that rises or the warm never the people that's the the thing that will continue and continue until it destroys whatever is put in there when it comes to the lake of fire it's described as eternal fire for example or the fire of the age to come and the and the result is total destruction which is described as michelle was saying as eternal smoke quote unquote or smoke that rises to the age of the age it's just the way for the prophets to describe as clear a word as they can in the clearest way as they can how this is total and some of our catholic or protestant friends have come to this biblical understanding of punishment or destruction and we always recommend a fella called edward fudge yes like fudge dessert. <laughs>
uh, the fire that consumes uh, again he was trinitarian and as far as we know he died a trinitarian and god will judge of course can we not agree with some of our you know trinitarian friends all right let's uh we have some time here let's go to the last one here in luke 19 as the last example here luke 19 so we will be involved in this unfortunate destruction of people perhaps even people we know think about that perhaps many people we know and yes so uh the word slaughter them some translations have slaughter basically now you know is this liter is are we literally going to you know cut people in pieces or whatever well again the the point for now is to understand that to reject the king to reject the nobleman who went away and then comes back the point is you will face certain awful violent judgment you know oh is it an actual sword is it an actual i think to me that's beside the point so here's a good question for me asking myself because i'm trying i'm trying always to put myself in the shoes of my audience and others so what do we do carlos meanwhile what are we supposed to do Okay, I'll give you a text here in 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Paul says, do not keep passing judgment before the time until the Lord comes. And then in Revelation 13, verse 10, if anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone, anyone as in a Christian, right, is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. So what do we do? That. We have to patiently endure many things in this present evil age. We have to endure the loss of loved ones. We have to endure sometimes the loss of our house burns up or something. We have to endure tragic things like accidents, unforeseen deaths of children, your own children. So it's a steadfast endurance in prayer and a refusal to submit to the present evil age, the idolatry that comes with it. Things like money, things like, you know, your family might not be happy with your religious beliefs. You have to sometimes break off that or unfortunately make your enemy, uh, yourself an enemy of your your own blood relatives, government, etc. So very idolatrous, this present evil age. You will note there in that Revelation 13, 10, just as a side note, the Greek usually somewhat limply rendered or very weakly rendered as patient endurance is in fact closer to absolute unbending determination. In other words, you have to have an iron will, the capacity to endure persecution, sometimes torture, physical torture, and ultimate death at the hands of your enemies without yielding your faith. By that, I mean your belief about Jesus and what he taught regarding this topic. And this is one of the fundamental attributes of your nonviolent resistance during this present evil age, the power to sustain blows, the power to endure scorn, people spitting in your face, uh, these are things that are the most difficult of things, but we must remain resolute. That's why I love that uh, verse in Isaiah, is it 52 or 53, about the suffering servant. It says he made his face like flint, like rock uh, before his enemies. That's how Jesus went to his awful, torturous death. People spitting in his face, making fun of him. A uh, note here, Revelation 13, 10, if anyone will kill with the sword, it is necessary for him to be killed with the sword. It's an echo of that Matthew 26, 52. Jesus told Peter, if you draw your sword, Peter, you're going to die by that sword too. We have to think about that. There's a warning against any attempt of the part of the Christian, of the church as a group of people to resort to this type of lethal self-defense. Christian violence is always reserved for the day of the Lord Jesus at his parousia. As nonviolent Christians that we are, but when we pray, may your kingdom come, just remember all those parables, all those threats of lethal violence.
Um, there's a website there on the screen, ChristEnemyLove.com. Uh, if you want to study this, talk. I know, again, I know we're in the minority. I know some of us may disagree, but again, we do this because I think we're compelled, obviously, by scripture, like all of us, to focus on fundamentals. I always see this as a fundamental, and I take, for example, the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. It's a very interesting chapter, that one, the so-called love chapter. You know, Paul's uh, is in the context, he's talking about the charismatic gifts, right? So things like speaking in foreign languages. And, and Paul says, but look, if I have all the gifts, if I have all the faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. In the end, Jesus said very clearly, the world will know you for one distinguishing mark in particular, and that's to love one another as I have loved you. So Jesus, even the Muslim scholars agree, Jesus was a nonviolent individual. Thanks for allowing me to speak to you on this matter.